distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of uh, the Center for Middle Eastern Strategic Studies, first of all, or some. Today we gather here on the occasion of the Tur japan turkey Dialogue on Global Affairs Symposium. It's a great pleasure for us to host you here in such a remarkable event that brings together uh, leading scholars from both sides. This symposium is the continuation of an ongoing dialogue between Turkish and Japanese think tanks. This year's symposium aims at discussing the latest developments in the Middle East and Central Asia, especially the issues of uh, refugees and humanitarian aid, foreign terrorist fighters, the impact of Iranian nuclear deal uh, on the regional politics, and uh, Russian foreign policy. It approaches, this symposium approaches uh, these issues from Japanese and Turkish perspectives. Before moving on the opening uh, speeches, we would like to express our sincere thanks and appreciation for, for the endless support uh, by the External Relations Presidency under the Prime Minister of Republic of Turkey, the Center for Strategic Research of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, some, and especially the Japanese embassy in Ankara. Their support and assistance has been vital for the realization of this event and of course the participation of you all. Dear guests, today we have two guests of honor who will make the opening speeches of the symposium. Uh, Dr. Gursa Donmas, the President for External Affairs under Prime Ministry of Republic of Turkey, and His Excellency Mr. Yutaka Yokoi, the Ambassador of Japan to Turkey. First, I would like to invite Dr. Gursak Donmas to deliver his remarks. Dr. Sayın Büyükelçiler, değerli katılımcılar. Aralarında kadim dostluk ilişkileri bulunan Türkiye ve Japonya'dan seçkin akademisyenleri, bugün Ankara'da bir araya getiren bu sempozyumu düzenleyen Orsan, Orta Doğu Stratejik Araştırmalar Merkezi'ni, Japonya Büyükelçiliği'ni ve Dışişleri Bakanlığı Stratejik Araştırmalar, Araştırmalar Merkezi'ni Kutlayarak söze başlamak gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Bugün burada yapılacak konuşmaların, tartışmaların, fikir alışverişinin, Türk-Japon işbirliğinin daha da ilerletilmesine yönelik yeni ve somut vizyonlar ortaya koymasını diliyoruz. Bu girizgah cümleleriyle hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum. Değerli katılımcılar, Ülkelerimiz arasında Türkiye-Japonya arasındaki coğrafi uzaklık tarih boyunca günümüzde devletlerimiz ve halklarımız arasında güçlü dostluk bağlarının kurulmasına engel teşkil etmemiş. Aksine bu zorluklar belki hızlandırıcı etkide de e, bulunmuştur. İki yıl önce diplomatik ilişkilerimizin 90. yılına kutlamış e, olduk. Ama Japonya'nın Dünya tarih sahnesine işe açılarak çıkmasından itibaren bizim ile Japonya arasında ilişkilerin sıcak dostane ilişkilerin başladı. Hepimizin malumu. Osmanlı döneminde Sultan II. Abdülhamit Han zamanında Japon İmparatoruna dostluğun bir nişanesi olarak II. Abdülhamit'in hediyeler göndermesi, sonrasındaki gelişmeler Hepimizin malumu, ee, filmlere konu olan trajik e, ortak hatıralarımızın da olduğu hepimizin malumu. Sözümün burasında 80'li yılların ortasını hatırladım. 
Benim öğrencilik yıllarımda Türkiye'de akademisyenlerimiz, entelektüellerimiz birçok Japonya'yı anlatan, kısaca Japonya müjdesi denilen konuları ele aldıkları yayınlar yapmışlardı. Japonya, Türkiye'nin, modern Türkiye'nin her zaman ilgi alanına girmiştir. Başarı hikayesi de ilgi alanına girmiştir. Kültürel yakınlığımız, o benzeyen noktalarımız itibariyle Türkiye'nin ve Türk halkının e, ilgi sahasına girmiştir. Herhalde böyle bir tarihsel, duygusal <gülüyor> arka plandan yola çıkarak olsa gerek, nihayet 2013 yılında iki ülke arasında stratejik ortaklık diyebileceğimiz bir zeminin oluşmasını hep birlikte memnuniyetle takip ettik. Özellikle son yıllarda her iki ülke arasında en üst düzeyde karşılıklı ziyaretlerin başladığını, artarak devam ettiğini görüyoruz. Yakın zamanda Japon Başbakanı e, Türkiye'deydi. E, Japonya'dan gelen heyetlerimiz, devlet adamları Türkiye'de e, haliyle en üst düzeyde karşılanıyorlar. Aynı şekilde biz Japonya heyetlerimiz haline gittiğimizde üst düzey bir misafir perverlikle karşılandığımızı görüyoruz ve bundan çok büyük memnuniyet duyduğumuzu ben bu vesileyle burada ifade etmek istiyorum. Ancak böyle bir çerçeve içerisinde karşılıklı ziyaretler, yapılan alışverişler, ortak yatırımlar, birlikte yürüttüğümüz ticarete baktığımızda maalesef altını çizerek şunu söylemek gerekiyor. Arzu ettiğimiz düzeyde bir e, ticaret hacmine henüz ulaşmadığımız görülüyor. Diğer taraftan Japon teknolojisi, Japon yatırımcılar ülkemizde e, bizim büyük projelerimizde yer alıyorlar. Gönül istiyor ki bizler arzu ediyoruz ki her iki ülke arasındaki işbirliği, e, ilişkiler daha üst düzeye çıksın. Ben e, umuyorum ki bugünkü e, burada yapılacak sempozyum, fikir alışverişi bu noktada ciddi bir katkı sağlayacaktır. Önümde 2014 yılının rakamları var. E, yani ticaret hacmi, hacmimiz e, 3.6 milyar dolar civarında kalmış. Bu Japonya düşünüldüğünde Türkiye'nin e, jeostratejik e, konumu, durumu düşünüldüğünde ee, çok çok az bir rakam. Umuyorum ki önümüzdeki yıllarda, önümüzdeki dönemde bu rakamı daha üst düzeylere çıkartacağız. Elbette Türkiye-Japonya ilişkilerini sadece bir ticaret ilişkisi olarak değerlendirmek de yanlış olur. Her iki, iki ülke arasında, iki ülkenin halkları arasında kültürel noktada bir benzeşme var. Mesela Japon milli takımı Dünya Kupası'na katıldığında Türkiye'deki birçok Türk gibi ben hemen Japonya taraftarı oluyorum. Demek ki iki ülke arasında bir sempati var. Bizlere düşen, düşen de bu sempatinin e, beraberliğimizi, ortak çalışmalarımızı daha da artırarak üst düzeylere taşımak olur. Bu vesileyle bu noktada e, bir teşekkür de ifade etmem gerektiğini düşünüyorum. E, Bizim dünyanın birçok yerinde halklar arasında kültürel alışverişi artırmak, tanışmayı derinleştirmek amacıyla kurduğumuz Yunus Emre Türk Kültür Merkezleri bir tanesi Tokyo'da kurulmuş oldu. Konuyla alakalı Japon Dışişleri Bakanlığı ve Japon devlet yetkilileri verdiği destek için bu noktada teşekkürlerimizi ifade etmek istiyorum. Diğer taraftan da özellikle akademik alanda, bilim alanında Türk-Japon Bilim ve Teknoloji Üniversitesi projemiz var. Bununla alakalı olarak biz Türkiye tarafı olarak İstanbul'da en azından yer vesaire konusunu olabildiğince hazırlamış vaziyetteyiz. Bu projenin çok hızlı bir şekilde yürürlüğe girmesi ve taraflar arasında yapılması söz konusu olan anlaşmanın bir an önce hayata geçirilmesi büyük önem taşıyor. Bunu arzu ettiğimizi 
Bu şekilde e, tekrar e, ifade etmiş olayım. Başlangıçta e, teşekkür e, cümleleri halinde işte Orsama ve diğer e, destekleyici e, kurumlara e, Japon Devleti'nin ilgili kurumlarına e, teşekkür etmiştim. Bugünkü sempozyumun ve bundan sonra da yine devam ettireceğimiz bir seferlik değil bu. Sempozyum benzeri ortak faaliyetlerimizin iki ülke arasındaki işbirliğinin artırmasını dileyerek, artıracağını düşünerek ben katılımlarınız için teşekkür ediyorum. Hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum. Arigato gozaimashita. Teşekkür ederim. Speech. Dear guests, now I would like to invite uh, His Excellency Mr. Yutaka Yokoi to deliver his speech. Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Merhaba, hoş geldiniz. Ben Yutaka Yokoi, Japonya Bölgesi'nin Bugün burada bir arada sizin de bir bir arada olmaktan çok huzur duyuyor. <gülüyor> Dr. Yürsel Gömez, President of External Relations Prime Minister and Dr. Şaban Kardaş, President of Bolsa. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. You are doing I get my great pleasure as Ambassador of Japan to witness this intellectual dialogue we initiated two years ago has turned into today's Japan-Turkey dialogue on global affairs. Today, we may say we are in a golden age of Japanese-Turkish relations because of the density of our inter interactions in various areas. Last year, commemorated the 125th anniversary of the M238 incident, and we had many high-level uh, exchanges between two countries, highlighted by President Edward's visit to Tokyo in October, and Prime Minister Abe's visit to Istanbul and Ankara in November. In December, we, the joint production film M2 1890 was released, in Turkey and Japan, and nearly one million people have watched this film in both countries. And it has been just nominated in many categories of the Japanese Academy Award, which will be announced this week in Tokyo. <coughs> the two episodes depicted in the film are only a small part of the vast examples of friendship between our people. And we have a long history of helping each other when one of us is in trouble. March the 11th will be the fifth anniversary of the Great East Japan earthquake. When we, we suffered this unprecedented disaster, the Turkish government and the people dispatched rescue teams and support goods and many messages to us. Despite the geographical distance between our countries, the Japanese people will never forget. When Earthquake quake hit Turkey in the same year, we just cooperated with your country as much as possible. When it comes to our cooperation in the economic fields, we have had large-scale projects such as Marmaray Tunnel, Izmit Bridge, Sinop Nuclear Power Plant, Turksat, and so on. In the fields of science, technology, and education, we are preparing for the establishment of Turkish-Japanese Science and Technology University, which is aimed to be a top-level university in the world. Today, at this symposium, I am hoping to see a series of active dialogues on Middle East, Central Asia, and bilateral cooperation after the keynote speeches that touches upon the diplomatic and security environment surrounding our countries. 
The situation around Turkey is gravely alarming, especially with terrorism in Syria and other areas overshadowing the region. The situation surrounding Japan is increasingly difficult with the development in the Southeast, South China Sea, and North Korea. Therefore, this symposium is a great opportunity for both of us to understand each other's positions and views through frank exchanges of opinions which will enhance our bilateral ties even further. I reckon Central Asia and Caucasus region is considered as your, as your friends and relatives. Japan is becoming more active in interacting and collaborating with this region. There are large-scale joint projects by Japanese and Turkish companies in Turkmenistan and other countries. On the issue of refugees from Syria and other regions, which is devastating now, Turkey is hosting 2.5 million <coughs> Syrian refugees or more. We appreciate all the efforts and that Turkish government and people are making. The Japanese government hopes to assist in reducing the Turkish government's burden by supporting the infrastructure of local municipalities in Eastern <coughs> Turkey, which is 370 million US dollars program, as well as assistance through other UN organizations. I sincerely hope this symposium will trigger further discussion of how the situation in the region we cover today will develop so that the horizon of our cooperation will be broadened. Lastly, to the participants of this symposium, thank you very much for coming and joining this symposium. And I would like to express my gratitude to Sam, Prime Ministry, and also and all other organizations which have helped this symposium. Let's continue our dialogue. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your speech. Dear guests, now I would like to invite Mr. Muharram Turgut, uh, Head of Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to deliver a welcome speech on behalf of the President of the Center for Strategic uh, Research, Professor Ali Resul Usul. Mr. Turgut, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Excellencies. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend my heartfelt congratulations to our partners for the organization of this timely symposium. Even though located at the opposite ends of the large Asian continent, Turkey and Japan enjoy excellent bilateral relations and deep-rooted friendship ties. Our two countries have sustained high-profile roles in, in international organizations. We combine traditional values with modernity. Foreign policies of the two countries have much in common as well. As peace-loving countries adhering to internationalism and pursuing human-oriented approaches, conformity of their policies towards the, to, towards the Middle Eastern region is of particular importance at this time in history. This event, bringing together esteemed experts and academicians from the two countries, serves to this very objective. I would like to thank once again our partners in organizing this event and wish the event a grand success. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your speech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we move to the keynote uh, addresses. The first keynote address will be delivered by Ambassador Shingo Yamagami, the Director of Japanese Institute of International Affairs, and a speech is titled Japan's Contribution to Peace, Security and Stability in Asia. Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Good 
morning, everybody. Well, unlike uh, previous speakers, uh, I don't have uh, any prepared statement. So let me just speak my mind. Uh, this is actually my first time uh, to come to Turkey. And uh, uh, for that, uh, I'd like to express my heartfelt appreciation uh, to organizers, especially in Osan, which was kind enough to extend me a warm invitation. I arrived in Ankara yesterday and it was unseasonably warm. So let me also express my you know, appreciation for warm reception you extended to me. And uh, my appreciation also goes to Ambassador uh, Yokoi, who is a renowned figure in the Japanese Foreign Service uh, for his leadership and uh, for his uh, especially foresight. And uh, you might know by now that, uh, you know, with his height, it is natural that he can see things far better than any of us. <laughs> And uh, uh, let me, you know, first touch upon a little bit about, uh, you know, the relationship between uh, Turkey and Japan, as I see it. And uh, yes, it seems to me we are two natural partners, friendship, only separated by long distance of 9,000 uh, kilometers. If I think of our bilateral relationship, uh, there are several commonalities between the two countries. First, both Turkey and Japan are leading nations in respective regions. These two nations you know, are endowed with long and colorful history and rich and amazing culture, honest people with pride and dignity, and above all, great food. And secondly, we are historically renowned as a nation of great warriors. Great warriors. I was stationed in London until about four years ago. Under you know, grey sky of winter, I, know, I used to like to stroll into one of the bookshops. My favorite subject was war history. Just the two subjects caught my attention. Gallipoli of 1915, Singapore of 1942. So our ancestors' <coughs> acts of valor, courage, fortitude are well remembered by one of the greatest former empires. Thirdly, our two countries are countries of understatement. Let us admit, we are so bad when it comes to spreading propaganda around the globe, unlike some of our partners. I recall my first exposure to things Turkish were through Hollywood movies, such as Lawrence of Arabia and Midnight Express. I know you are not too happy about those movies, not to speak of the recent British one, Downton Abbey. Same is true of movies made about Japan by Hollywood and others. Not to mention Bridge Over River Kwai, Lost in Translation, and even worse, Kill Bill, B-class movie you might recall. So we have to do something. Maybe it's high time for us to make movies jointly again. Yes. But without further ado, let us uh, touch upon the uh, security situation surrounding uh, Japan and uh, how Japan is going to respond to it. By the way, uh, I was in the Japanese Foreign Service until October of last year, but now I'm totally emancipated from the shackles of government. So uh, some Americans call me Kunta Kinte of Tokyo. 
<laughs> so just bear with me for you know, 10, 15 minutes. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you right now is completely my own, my personal observation. It has got nothing to do with Japanese government or my institute, Japan Institute of International Affairs. First, much has been said in East Asia, security environment has become increasingly severe. What do I mean by that? Let me explain. Well, this is a familiar map to us Japanese. Maybe not to our Turkish friends. You know this Korean Peninsula, but some Americans call it Sword of Damocles pointed at the heart of Japan. Why? Historically, national security threats to Japan often come through this peninsula, not to mention 13th century Mongolian attempted invasion of Japan twice, or we fought two great wars. I'm talking about Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95 and Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905. These two wars are fought, simply put, fought over control and influence of, of this nation. And believe me that uh, you know, the last one, the second World War, was fought about China between Japan and the United States. Maybe just simplistic, but uh, that's the one aspect of truth. But what I'd like to mention here is Japan is in an envious position to be surrounded by three countries which have either nuclear states or which proclaimed position of nuclear weapon, i.e. Russia, <laughs> China, North Korea. And each and every of these three countries has stand, standing army of more than a million. That's why I call Japanese situation envious. You may have trouble with your neighbors, but uh, you can feel a kind of sympathy for the situation Japan is put in. Yes, this is a defense budget increase of uh, Japan's continental neighbor. 41 times in 27 years, 3.6 times in 10 years. So in absolute <coughs> figures, now it is 3.3 times larger than that of Japan. Let's take a look at uh, you know, uh, region by region. First, Korean Peninsula. I think uh, anybody in this room is aware of uh, numerous ballistic missile launches uh, done by North Korea, as well as nuclear tests. The recent one was conducted in January of this year. There is an interesting you know, pattern here. Nuclear test, satellite launch, nuclear test, satellite launch, nuclear test, and uh, you know, satellite launch, or launch of ballistic missiles. This time, nuclear test comes first, but it was accompanied by a satellite launch. Some would say in this coming May, there will be Workers' Party Congress, first time in 36 years. So now is the time for this uh, young chubby leader with a unique hairstyle to show his leadership, but which is rather scary to us. Then, Let's turn our attention to South China Sea. Much has been said about the preposterous nature of these nine dash lines drawn by this continental country. It is a matter of grave concern to almost any coastal state, especially countries like Philippines and Vietnam and uh, let me emphasize here, this is an important body of water 
not only to coastal nations like these countries, but also to countries like Japan or countries like Turkey and Europe. You know, whose goods and services have to go through this body of water when you are going to export your goods and services to Northeast Asia or Southeast Asian countries. So this should be a matter of concern to any one of us. Well, this shows a you know, rapid pace and scale of reclamation and also militarization of some of the islands in the South China Sea. This is quite ominous. Then, this is a familiar map drawn by you know, one of my friends. Uh, he's a retired admiral in the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Forces, Mr. Koda. He drew you know, this map. There is a facility for aircraft carrier in this island. And airstrip was completed, and port facility is also completed here on Udi Island. Recently, ground to air missile was instituted. And now, port and airstrip are you know, about to be completed on this fiery cross reef. So, if facilities are going to be completed on one of the Scarborough Shore, this triangle, you know, exemplifies control over sea and airspace over the South China, the South China Sea. This is what we mean we have to you know, uphold freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight. Yes, the next slide shows what kind of regional order we would like to see here. That is the biggest question. I am not telling our Turkish friends to take the side of China or Japan or China, United States. But I would like to ask for your consideration as to what kind of regional and international order you would like to see in this part of the world. <laughs> By the way, I used to go to a elementary school, which was not in a so nice neighborhood. From time to time, I was bullied. And this is a typical statement to me. This is a typical statement by a bully. But not only that, this kind of official statement was accompanied by this advertisement. This advertisement was done by Chinese embassy in Manila in one of the Philippine newspapers. See? This is the flag of Philippines. Filipinos, these are all other Southeast Asian nations. For some reason, under this advertisement, Filipinos are depicted as the shortest and the funniest looking figure. And this illustration is accompanied by this warning what kind of intimidation is this? My Filipino friends take this as a grave insult. We have to establish, establish regional international order in which we treat other countries as equals. If there is any lesson we Japanese learned through the defeat in the devastating war, is no more bullying and equal partnership. This is the Japanese answer. Rule of law at sea is the short word. Prime Minister Abe stated this in public. You have to make claims based upon international law, no use of force or coercion, peaceful settlement of disputes. To most of you, this just sounds common sense. But the problem about East Asia is common sense is yet to prevail. Let's take a look at uh, what's going on <coughs> in the East China Sea. This is the Senkaka Islands, Japanese islands, and only in 1971, 1971, Chinese started their claims over these islands. 
after more than 70, 70 years of silence. And they started, you know, intruding into territorial waters around the Senkaku Islands. Not in 2010, after so-called nationalization of Japan, of three of those islands, but started in 2008. And Chinese fishing boats are running into Japanese Coast Guard ship, not only at sea, but also in the air. They proclaimed air defense identification zone, and their military flights you know, flying very, very dangerously. So acts of provocation continue both at sea and in the airspace. You don't send your boats into disputed waters. Usually you try to solve the issue peacefully, but this is not the case in the East China Sea, regrettably. And uh, this shows the frequency of intrusion into territorial waters and also you know, their entry into contiguous zones around the Senkaku Islands. The important thing is even after the summit meeting between Japanese Prime Minister Abe, Chinese leader Xi Jinping, they are continuing their entry. And uh, this shows uh, unilateral development on oil and natural gas resources by our continental neighbor in the East China Sea. We are yet to you know, agree on the delimitation line dividing line of exclusive economic zones and continental share between Japan and China in the East China Sea. But uh, without you know, uh, listening to Japanese urging to stop this kind of you know, unilateral exploitation, it's being continued. Okay, the final slide about regional situation shows we cannot forget about our northern, <coughs> northern neighbor. Yes, Russia is your neighbor, but Russia is Japan's neighbor as well. Actually, you know, the number of Japanese air self-defense forces scramble flights against Russian aircraft are on steady increase. Russians like to call it Tokyo Express. They fly around the Japanese archipelago in an intimidating manner. And as you can see from this you know, graph, Russia continues to be a number one customer for Japanese air self-defense forces pilot. So these are the situation that you know, we are facing in East Asia. <coughs> and uh, let me draw an analysis between what's going on in East Asia and what's going on in your neighborhood. Prime Minister Abe, as well as Foreign Minister Kishida, repeatedly you know, made sure that we will not you know, uh, condone any attempt to change the status quo by force or coercion. This applies not only to the situation in Crimea, Ukraine, but also to the situation in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. So, after having taken a look at our regional situation, uh, let me go on to my final point. What is going to be Japan's reaction? This may sound cliche, but uh, you know, we renewed our recognition. No nation, especially Japan, can maintain its own peace and security alone. So we need coordination with our <coughs> allies, United States, and our partners, you know, UN collective security measures, peacekeeping operation, their significance is up, and uh, need to strengthen you know, alliance with the United States. What shall we do in specific terms? The policy you know, announced by Prime Minister Abe is proactive contribution to peace. You don't have to worry that Japan's peaceful orientation might change. No, it will you know, stay the same. But we would like to be more proactive. Proactive in two regards. First, seamless response to any situation to defend Japan. Second, more robust contribution to international peace and stability. 
These two are the pillars of Prime Minister Abe's policy of proactive contribution to peace. Specifically, what will be you know, changing? I just mentioned, in the interest of time, I just mentioned three big changes for the interest of uh, you know, Turkish friends. The first one is Japan will participate in wider range of UN peacekeeping operations and other internationally coordinated efforts. Other internationally coordinated efforts include, you know, for example, common security and defense you know, policy you know, initiatives done by the European Union. And I know that the uh, Turkish government is very much interested in reinforcing its contribution to UN peacekeeping operation. So here we have some point <coughs> of you know, conference. The second big change is we are going to enhance our logistic support to international operations. For example, if there is going to be another, you know, Iraq war or a mission in Afghanistan, certainly Japan's logistics support will be enhanced. You know, it will include provision of ammunition, it will include refueling of aircraft you know, about to take off for combat missions. Finally, exercise of the right of collective self-defense. Any student of international you know, law would say, what do you mean by that? Yes, you're right. Each and every nation of the United Nations has the right not only to individual <coughs> self-defense, but also to collective self-defense. But because of the peaceful constitution, Japanese government has taken a long stand position not to resort to the exercise of the right of collective self-defense. But under some you know, very active legal debate, we have you know, uh, employed uh, these new three con conditions for use of force. You might be surprised to see you know, Japanese are so methodical or legalistic, but we are. And uh, only if this condition in red letters are met, Japan will be first allowed to exercise its right to <coughs> collective self-defense. But we are not going to be indifferent to situation in the Middle East. Actually, during the de debate in the Diet, you know, on, on many occasions, <coughs> example of the blockade of Strait of Hormuz by sea mines was mentioned. And of course, it's up to specific situation, but there are some possibilities the situation in the Middle East may satisfy this requirement and Japan will be allowed under its current constitution to exercise collective self-defense right. Let me finish by touching upon some of the criticism directed at Japan's new national security you know, policy. First, there are some voices in just a limited number of Northeast Asian capitals who say Things like this. Japan will become a military nation and threat to the region. Okay. My answer to this is nonsense. And Prime Minister Abe repeatedly stated his intention. Peaceful orientation will never change. But uh, here, let me share one interesting statistic with you. This is a public opinion poll conducted in. You know, many countries, you know, just a few months ago. The question was asked, if there were a war that involved your country, would you be willing to fight for your country? The same question was asked. In a country like this, China and Russia, yes answer was very hard. In European countries, relatively low, France, UK, Germany, but Japan recorded the lowest figure. Only 11% said, yes, I'm going to fight for Japan. I understand, uh, you know, great soldier, including, you know, uh, great, you know, Kemal Pasha, would have stated, looking at this, how pathetic 
<laughs> I agree. Pathetic, yes. But this shows the deep rooted nature of Japan's pacifism. So you don't have to worry about Japan becoming, you know, Womonga or militarist country. <coughs> Finally, Japan's security policy is not supported by Asian countries. No. The problem here is uh, one of our neighbors seems to have uh, the monopoly of Asian opinions. But it's not the case at all. It's actually, our policy is supported by a number of countries. Look at this. These are you know, examples of countries which have either expressed welcome or support to Japan's new policy of proactive contribution to peace. Here, I regret to say, your country is missing. So I'm just dying for a day you know, when Turkey will say, yes, we do support you, Japan. Thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you for your speech and very comprehensive presentation. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mesut Özcan, Director of Diplomacy Academy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to deliver his keynote address, which is entitled Turkish Foreign Policy in a Changing Regional Order. Dr. Özcan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I'd like to welcome all of the participants on behalf of the organizers, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm reminded uh, by Shah and Kailash that I have only 15 minutes because we are a bit late of the program, so I will be as brief as possible. Uh, by listening to the professor about the Japanese security challenges, I thought that Turkey is not that bad in that regard. So we were sometimes uh, complaining about our own situation regarding the, uh, neighbor, our neighborhood and also the challenges that we are facing from the south, from the north. But after listening to the Japanese example, we can also uh, share some kind of similarity in the regard as well. But uh, Turkey is also having a very uh, difficult neighborhood and now in Turkish foreign policy, we are witnessing every day the negative outcomes of this neighborhood. So uh, there are several security challenges uh, in our vicinity, unfortunately, nowadays. And in, in, in these regards, in that regard, we are uh, facing the challenges posed by these uh, security challenges. And when we talk about the security challenges in our neighborhood, unfortunately, most of the time, in the last couple of years, we are talking about the security challenges in the Middle East. And the unfolding events since the uprisings in the region are posing on one hand some challenges, but at the same time some opportunities. However, given the state failures in many countries in the region, these are there are several problems for Turkey and Turkish foreign policy. The first one is related with the security issues. The unfolding ones in the Middle East is posing serious security threats for Turkey, emanating from either from Syria or from Iraq or from other parts of the region. So uh, currently, Turkey is dealing with these security challenges. On the other hand, the unfolding events in the region is also pro uh, posing some economic challenges for Turkey as well. And uh, in the last decade or so, Turkey increased its economic cooperation with the Middle Eastern region. But uh, the events and the instabilities in the region also created some setbacks for Turkish economic interests in the region. And as a result of this development, we also have some economic uh, difficulties emanating from the region. In addition to that, beginning with the last year, the decline of oil prices on the one hand is a very good development for Turkey for Turkish economic policy, since Turkey is a huge importer of oil and gas. But on the other hand, in, a, in, in an indirect way, the decline of oil resources is creating some problems for the Turkish markets in the neighboring regions. So in, the, in a direct way, we are benefiting from the decline of oil prices, 
but in an indirect way, we are negatively affected by the decline of oil prices. So the Middle Eastern markets are also becoming increasingly limited for Turkish products. The third aspect that the security challenges in the region is, uh, or the developments in the region providing or uh, causing some difficulties for Turkey is the humanitarian nature. And this is maybe one of the difficult tasks for Turkey. Uh, as it is mentioned in, in previous speeches, now Turkey is hosting more than 2.5 million Syrian refugees. Besides this, there are also Iraqi refugees as well. There are 200,000 Iraqi refugees are also in Turkey. And uh, this refugee issue is creating several problems for Turkey, especially for the governorates on the visit of Syria and Iraq. So, as you may know, in, in governorates like Kilis, the Syrian population is more than the local population. So it is a huge burden in economic terms and also in social terms. So Turkey, Turkish government at the same time, Turkish NGOs are trying to deal with the humanitarian aspect of this challenge as well. So uh, regarding our neighborhood in the Middle East, uh, there are serious challenges and Turkey is dealing with these challenges day by day. And unfortunately, in our neighborhood, we are not only having problems in, in the Middle East, but in, in other parts of the region, in, our, in other parts of our neighborhood, especially in, in our north, in Caucasia, and also in, in, in the former Soviet space, let's say, we are also having difficulties. I was with the minister last week in Georgia, so Turkey is trying to develop good relations with the Caucasian countries as well. But uh, even the territorial integrity of Georgia is under threat, so they are not fully controlling their territory. And regarding the latest developments in Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, the developments in eastern Ukraine, so there are lots of difficulties in our north as well. And uh, as a result of these uh, difficulties, uh, unfortunately our security situation in the north is not also very uh, peaceful. So for this reason, Turkey is also very much alert in that region as well. And the conflict in Caucasia, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan in terms of occupation of Karabakh, there are also, unfortunately, there are some skirmishes, tensions on the armistice line. So we should be also very vigilant of the developments taking place in, in, this, in this part of the world as well. In our West, uh, thanks, we don't have much security problems, but the economic uh, crisis and its aftermath still affecting the European continent. And the refugee issue emanating from the Middle East is directly affecting the developments in Europe, especially Greece, the Balkan countries, and also till Germany. And as you follow, last, last year was uh, the year in which refugee issue dominated the agenda of the European continent, and this year, Maybe this issue will continue to dominate the agenda as well. In that regard, although we do not have any kind of security problem uh, in, in our West, in the Balkans, still there are several economic and humanitarian challenges in this part of the world as well. After having all of these challenges and also very negative picture, uh, I, I, I should say also some positive, uh, positive words as well. There are some positive steps and also some positive signs that we may have a kind of solution uh, in Cyprus this year. The talks are going on in a very positive way. And today, Turkish Under Secretary of Minister of Foreign Affairs is in Greece, and Turkish Minister uh, will visit Greece on Friday. So, uh, when listening to the Japanese example, I, had, uh, I remember the, the Turkish and Greek uh, problems in the agency in Cyprus. But although there are still some problems, some difficulties, Turkey and Greece find some ways to, to decrease the tension, and they are trying to overcome these challenges in by bilateral negotiations. And in a positive note, as I said, the trend in, in, in, on the island, in, in Cyprus, is for a solution uh, this year. There are some hopes, there are talks going on, and I hope this will be a very positive uh, dynamic for the regional environment, for the regional security as well. In the Middle East, the, uh, the nuclear uh, agreement regarding the Iranian nuclear program is also a very positive development for Turkey. 
Turkey, from the very beginning of this issue, uh, supported a kind of diplomatic solution. Also, Turkey initiated with Brazil a, a similar initiative that, that, that was secured last year. And thanks to this uh, P, P5 plus 1 agreement, uh, we, we hope that that would be a kind of uh, solution to this nuclear program. And this will bring, on the one hand, at least some kind of release of tensions in the region. And on the other hand, this will also provide some economic opportunity for Turkey and also for other countries in the region in that regard. This will work with positive development. And uh, in a final note, in our neighborhood, although we have some challenges in the Middle East, in the Caucasus, in our north, in, in Ukraine, in, Georgia, in Georgia, in Russia, still uh, there are also some positive developments and Turkey is trying to increase its option, not only in our neighborhood, but also in other areas as well. For example, Turkish president is now visiting uh, West Africa and uh, Turkish president and also officials also increasing their contacts with Latin American countries and also East Asian countries. So, although we, our neighborhood is also pro, our neighborhood providing, uh, causing several challenges for Turkey, Turkish foreign policy, Turkey is trying to diversify its options, not only in its region, but also in other areas like Africa, like Latin America or East Asia. And uh, Turkish presence and also activism in Africa is an example in that regard. And Turkey is uh, also very much uh, benefiting from, from its uh, newly developed relations in these uh, areas. So, uh, for, for this year, for 2016, there will be some tra troubles in our neighborhood, this is very obvious, but on the other hand, Turkey should also, uh, doing, do, Turkey is also doing its best to at least elevate some of the negative outcomes of this, and also contribute to the solution of the problems like Cyprus and also aging issues and also Turkey is also contributing to the humanitarian uh, problems emanating uh, from the conflict in, in the Middle East. And uh, I hope uh, this uh, symposium uh, will contribute to Turkish and Japanese perspectives in, in, in their respective regions. Uh, as it is described by, by Professor uh, the Japanese neighborhood, although there is an interest about Japan, most of the time Turkish knowledge about the Japanese secret challenges or the developments in East Asia is very limited. And this, this symposium and this cooperation by Turkish and Japanese counterparts will contribute to a better understanding of the respective regions and also respective countries. Thank you for coming. For your speech. Uh, dear guests, once more I would like to express our sincere appreci appreciation for the speeches by the esteemed uh, guests and speakers in this very opening session. Now before we move to the first panel, uh, I would like to give you the good news about the coffee break. Uh, now let's give a break, a very short one of 15 minutes before we continue with the first panel. Thank you. Thank you.